the substitution of the notion that we are supposed to live in a godly community in which we treat each other well. The movement away from that toward, you know, that, that person really offends me and I don't like them and that makes me morally superior for not liking them. That's, that's a real net negative. There's a God-shaped hole in the American heart and it's being filled with dislike of our neighbors. Today I'm joined by Ben Shapiro, the founding editor-in-chief of The Daily Wire. He's the host of the number one conservative podcast show in the nation. He's the New York Times number one best-selling author. And Ben, thanks for being here today. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You're no stranger to controversy, hot topic issues of the day, but I thought we'd start with the thing that I think is most important to you, your family. You're a father of three. You're married. Um, I wanted to start with, with this. What have you learned uh, from being a husband? What have you learned from being a dad? Well, from being a dad, it's that everything is moment to moment, ad hoc. You have a plan. The plan is destroyed immediately. <laughs> uh, the, the, the way I describe being a parent is that it's half puppy, puppy store and half insane asylum. Uh, it, it's, it, that, that, listen, being a parent is a hard job, and that the more rules and, and roles you create for your kids, the better off your kids are going to be. We kind of live in a society that, that views permissiveness as a parental point in favor, and, and that's really not the case. The fact is that if you don't have some pretty significant structures, that some guardrails for your kids, that you're, you're not only harming them, you're, you're really destroying them. Uh, and I think that's what we've seen in our society, is a society that treats children like small adults capable of making decisions they're utterly unqualified for and allowing parents to completely abdicate their responsibility. And if you're not thinking every day, every moment of every day virtually, about what you need to do to make sure that your kids grow up healthy and safe in a culture that wants to destroy them, uh, you're, you're not doing your job. So that's what I've learned from being a, a, a father. Uh, from being a husband, um, I, I've, I've learned that funny things that I say are often not taken that way. <laughs> uh, I've learned that, you know, my, my wife is, is great at uh, a number of things, but she will not kill a spider. And there, there, there are a lot of things to learn in marriage, but uh, the, the number one thing to, I, I think to learn in marriage is that it obviously it really is a, a partnership and that the, the biggest flaw in marriage, and this is the hardest thing, uh, is to expect more of yourself and less from your partner. Mm. Uh, and if both partners do this, you'll have a successful marriage. If one partner does this, you'll have a very unsuccessful marriage. Thank God my wife and I have a very successful marriage. And you both are, are very successful people. You, you are a lawyer. She's a doctor. Who do you think is smarter, lawyer or, or, or doctor? I mean, when it, comes to, when it comes to medical issues and STEM, she's definitely smarter than I am. When it comes to politics, she will acknowledge that that, <laughs> that, is, that is my field. So, Obviously, parenting is very important to you. One of the big issues we face in society today is fatherlessness. What should we be doing to address that? I mean, I think the first thing we should be doing is you, the, the only way that boys particularly learn to be fathers is to have father figures. And so what that means is that we need to strengthen not only the families, but, but we also need to strengthen religious communities, which provide an enormous support structure of father figures for, for kids, even when there is no father. You know, recently, as in our community, there's a horrific circumstance where a father of six uh, just suddenly passed away. Mm. And, uh, and the kids, I know, because this is a very solid community, are going to be taken in by the community. There will be a bevy of father figures who come in and attempt to, to fill as much of the gap as they possibly can and provide for, for strong male role models and leadership. And this is actually what the social science data tends to show, is that actually the, the single best predictor of how young men in a community are going to do is not whether specific young men have fathers, it's how many fathers there are in the community at large, so that even the young men who don't have father fig fathers have father figures. Uh, the, the other thing is that, frankly, we have to go back to a system where sex within marriage matters. Mm. And that is not just a male issue, that is a female issue. It used to be that the incentive for men to get married was that sexual relationships existed within the confines of marriage. As we become a more promiscuous society, no shock, it turns out there are more kids that are born out of wedlock, and males feel no responsibility to the children, and females feel that it's asking something of men to be responsible for the kid. So, I mean, the, the biblical description of what marriage and family are supposed to be continues to be correct, shockingly. Uh, that, that a male is supposed to leave his father and mother and he's supposed to cling to his wife and they form a new family unit and the child springs therefrom. I mean, this, uh, all of this was very basic and, uh, and then we wrecked it. So we're going to have to rebuild the ground up. You talk openly, you're, you're a man of faith. What role does your faith play uh, in raising your kids? Your I mean, family? an enormous role. I would say that, that my life is defined by my faith in a deep and abiding way. So as an Orthodox Jew, we are bound morning to night uh, by, by a bevy of commandments, 613 of them, governing everything from how we eat to the blessings we make when we eat to you know, how, we, how we deal with the time period between Friday night and, and Saturday night to how many times we pray every day, three. Uh, you know, like, uh, pretty much, uh, there are a lot of rules that govern our, our lives. And that not only gives structure, it also creates a sense of community. I want to bring my kids up within that structure, within that sense of community, and pass on that, that 
generational lineage because we're part of an unbroken chain of history springing from Sinai. And so passing that down to future generations is deeply, deeply important to me. It's why we send our kids to a Jewish school. Uh, it's why we you know, visit Israel. Like, all, all these things are very important as a Jew to me. Uh, on a broader faith level, the, the, the necessity for faith in America, it's the only thing that's going to save the country. I mean, I'm, I'm a Jew and I'm encouraging people who are Christians or who were Christians, go back to church. You need to be spending time in church. You need to be bringing your kids up in the context of a church. There is no substitute for faith not only because of the communal bonds that, that it creates, and not only because of the tried and true wisdom that religion passes down over the course of generations, but, but also because many of the foundations of what we think of as secular morality are actually rooted in faith traditions, in the simple idea that God created the universe with predictable rules, and that we have minds capable of grasping those rules. These are religious principles, but those principles lie at the root of science. Evolutionary biology has nothing to say about the notion of absolute truth. If you want to believe in absolute truth, whether scientific or moral, you have to go beyond that. And there, I mean, look, there's, there's a reason why all of the great universities of Europe were originally built within the confines of the church. Uh, and that continues to be the case today. I, mean, I think that a philosophy that's completely bereft of God is likely leading in incredibly dangerous directions where you are, you're so reliant on your own perception of of what you believe the world should look like, that you're completely disconnected from reality. You mentioned a couple of things there I, I wanted to, to circle back to, to borrow a phrase. <laughs> um, as you become more popular, as you become more busy in your life, how, how has Sabbath kind of helped you stay? Um, the most, I mean, the most powerful word is no. And, and being able to say, listen, phone goes off, computer goes off. I am now, now is a 25 hour period where I'm connecting with my family and with God and, where, and with my community. I mean, it's, it's indispensable. It's absolutely indispensable. And you're starting to see people actually in the secular community realizing that Sabbath is useful, whether you celebrate on sa Saturday or Sunday. Mm -hmm. And you're starting to see people saying, well, you know, technology has taken over my life. I can't disconnect. I'm, I'm immersed in work all the time. I feel disconnected from my own kids. I feel like I'm living in an online world where I have no connection with actual human beings. Well, what Sabbath does, it reconnects you with all the human beings that matter most to you. And you realize that online is not a world that really ought to be controlling your life and that there's a difference between work and rest. And there, there's a notion in, in Judaism that when you make Kiddush, right, when you, on Friday nights you say some blessings that are called Kiddush, which is literally sanctification, that what you're doing is you're sanctifying time. God gives you the ability as a free human being to sanctify time, which is why in the Bible, when it describes the rationale for why you keep the Sabbath, it says, because I took, I'm, I'm the God who took you out of Egypt. What do those two things have to do with each other? What, is, what does the exodus from Egypt have to do, per se, with the celebration of the Sabbath? And the idea is when you're a slave, you don't have control of your own time. When you're a free person, then you do have control of your own time. And so the Sabbath is the gift of time that's given to us. Hmm. During COVID, church attendance really tanked and we haven't seen it get back to the, the place where it was prior to COVID. I mean, what do you attribute that to? And do you think, do you think that the United States is still a Judeo-Christian nation? So I think that unconsciously it's a Judeo-Christian nation, meaning that all the values that we believe that we hold dear are springing from that tradition. But in terms of, you know, consciously, is it is a nation with enough Christians in it uh, or enough people of Christian faith or Jewish faith who actually take it seriously in it? And the answer is no. I mean, increasingly, the, the fastest growing group in America is the seculars, the, the nothings, right? The people mm -hmm. who say they don't believe in anything. Uh, and that's incredibly problematic for the future of, of the United States, for sure. Like, I, I think that the, the reality is that, that, look, COVID was the capstone on decline in church attendance that's been going on for a very long time in this country. And one of the reasons for that is because churches, this is true for synagogues also in, in large parts of, of the Jewish community, religious institutions have decided that they don't want to offend anybody. Hmm. And sorry, but God tends to be kind of offensive. It turns out that when he has standards for human behavior, that those standards are going to offend people who don't agree with those standards for human behavior. But that's why you are not God. And so the, 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 the sort of let's do pizza and guitar playing at church on a Sunday, and that's going to bring in the crowd. Why would that bring in the crowd? That sounds terrible. Right? When you see synagogues do the same thing, you see Reform, Conservative, even some modern Orthodox synagogues that will get into the business of, well, you know, what we really need to do is we need to make people feel better about themselves. That's what religion is about. It's about feeling better. That's not what religion is about. Religion is about inculcating a sense of duty and loyalty and principle in your life that gives you the sense of meaning necessary to go forward and be a successful, productive human being. And when you move away from that stuff, of course nobody's going to go to church. We can go to church when you go to a movie. Why would you go to church to, to hear a second-rate band play you music that, that they wouldn't even that wouldn't even make the radio why would you do that right you can have music that's fine but it has to be added on to a set of principles that is eternal otherwise why are you going to church if, if there's no eternal principles attached what is the point of going and sitting on a hard bench for three hours and having people sing the same songs at you in your book the right side of history you talk about how church used to be this place that brought community together which which was this unifying thing it seems like in america today there are very few things that bring us together. What, 
has taken the place of church? Has anything taken the place of church? What still brings us together? I mean, cultish political loyalty has taken the place of church. I mean, what, what seems to be bringing people together is being really, really mad at people we disagree with politically, and this is true left, right, and center. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the substitution of politics for godliness is, is a real negative. Now, this is not to say there's no politics to religion. I mean, I'm very political and I'm very religious, and I think that the Bible is not an apolitical document. It has very strong perspectives on a wide variety of political issues ranging from abortion to same-sex marriage. With that said, the substitution of the notion that we are supposed to live in a godly community in which we treat each other well, the movement away from that toward, you know, that, that person really offends me and I don't like them and that makes me morally superior for not liking them. That's, that's a real net negative. There's a God-shaped hole in the American heart and it's being filled with dislike of our neighbors. You have made it a point in, in your life and I think your personal and professional life uh, to not be in a silo, to have friends who are left, friends who are right. Why is that a priority to you? I mean, I, I think that I, I frankly can't be clear enough in my own views if I never hear an opposing point of view. Mm. I think it's really important to, to challenge my own point of view because either maybe I'll be convinced, but more likely I'll, I'll be able to actually think through why I hold the position that I hold. And that means that I, I have a wide spectrum of people that I draw from, ranging from people who are, you know, I would say more nationalist conservative to libertarian friends, to people who are full scale on the left in terms of economics, to people who are left wing in terms of social politics. Like th those are all arguments that, that can be had and should be had, mm -hmm. and discussions that can be had in, in many cases where you can agree to disagree. Uh, but, but the one thing that you can't do is make your own values subject to friendship. And what I mean by that is that if you have to choose between giving up your values and giving up a friendship, you have to give up the friendship. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do believe the values are paramount. There has to be at least a common sense of baseline value. So even the people who I disagree with, who I'm friends with, we all agree that the value in our friendship is in the open discussion that we can have with each other and that we put our disagreements to the side for the sake of the friendship. That in of, and of itself is actually a hierarchy of values. But what's being asked of a lot of people right now is I can't be friends with you unless you abandon all of your core values. And then that's not a friendship, that's just a browbeating. I mean, so you, you're famous for the line, the facts don't care about your feelings, right? Um, but as, as we know, right, we're all driven by emotion, we're driven by spirituality. Um, but right now there are these walls that everybody has up. They don't even want to, people don't even want to listen to people that have different points of view from them. How do you, how do you go about perhaps appealing to the, to the head and to the heart at the same time? Well, I mean, I think the first thing to say when it comes to, to people who want to argue emotionally is this is not a conversation really worth having if we're going to argue from that place. Because you, really, like not every conversation is worth having. I mean, you can tell within the first five minutes of a conversation whether this is going to be a, I want you to affirm my most deeply held feelings or whether this is going to be a let's have a discussion conversation. And sometimes you can actually disarm somebody that way. You can mm -hmm. say, listen, I know this is emotional. It's emotional for me too. Mm -hmm. Can we put that to the side and try to have like a rational conversation about the actual policy prescriptions that we're discussing? Sometimes that's not possible and that's not possible. You shouldn't waste your breath. When you're having a, a debate with somebody, we've seen you at YAF, we've seen you a bunch of places where you know, people are challenging you with some pretty crazy you know, questions. How do you, how do you balance um, your emotions during that time. You were always so very well composed. Is there ever a time where you feel like, um, perhaps it's, it's like a righteous anger, right? Like where you feel like, it's like, all right, like this is something where I feel like I'm gonna. Oh, yeah, no, that, that, that definitely happens from time to time. Uh, or somebody will, usually when somebody's being incredibly insulting, right? when somebody just asks a normal question, uh, then I'm not gonna get agitated because mm -hmm. in normal question, normal conversation, that's fine. Uh, it's when somebody decides to get up there and be like incredibly insulting, they'll insult my wife, they'll insult my kids. Like this stuff actually happens at YAF speeches uh, where, where somebody will get up and they'll say something nasty about me or something about my wife or something about our sex life or something like that. And I, I, I really, the thing that I really have to hold back on is that I happen to be very quick on my feet with comedic lines. And I, man, I've had so many doozies that I've really just had to pull the punch on. And it, it, it breaks my heart because I wish I could say them. They're so good. And later, I, I have like the George Costanza jerk store thing going, and I'm like, man, should I have said it? Maybe I should. Nah, that would ruin my image. I was wearing a yarmulke. I probably shouldn't have said <laughs> that. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, well, what, I will say that one of the things that the yarmulke on the top of my head does is it keeps me honest, right? It's like, okay, well, do I want to be the guy in the yarmulke who's saying that word? Probably not. In, in say, the, the last uh, 10 or 15 years, I mean, you've had quite the arc of working, you know, from college to Breitbart to starting the Daily Wire. Um, what would you say was your biggest learning moment or moments uh, in that period of time? Um, so th th there have been a few, I would say. Uh, so the, the, the first one that I would say really was, was kind of 
important. What, first of all, I mean, you learn everything from all of your failures. Whenever you fail, you learn something, which is, which is good. I mean, you, you learn not to rely on luck. You actually have to have a business plan. You have to think of profit and laws. Right? When you're running a business, you have to make sure that everything runs. Uh, that, that, but that's all obvious stuff. In terms of, sort of personal lessons, so I remember there was one time that I was, I was at a meeting. This is when I was thinking about working for a 501c3. And I was, and I was having a meeting with a, a major funder. And this person was you know, relatively well-known, maybe in like a particular corner of the universe. And this person also happened to be a big funder of a magazine. And I'd never read this magazine. I'd never heard of this magazine. We're in the meeting, and the person says, have you read this magazine? And you do what you, know, you kind of normally do, which is you fib, right? You're like, yeah, of course. It's great. It's wonderful. And then the person asks what you always dread, which is the follow-up question, which is, so if you, do you have any recommendations for how we can make the magazine better? And so at this point, you're in trouble. So what do you do? So in this particular case, you go to like a, a go-to, right? Is it like something that you figure any, any magazine you name can be more of this. So you'll be like, okay, well, so I said to this person, well, you know, it, it, I, I, you know, it would be great if it were a little more academic. Because like, how many magazines are like full on? It turns out this is like the most academic magazine <laughs> that is produced. And I walked out and the guy I was with was like, you have no idea what he's talking about, did you? And from this I learned, if you don't know something about a topic, just say up front you don't know anything about a topic. So that, that was a... That was a big one. Uh, the other one that I've learned is, uh, you know, speaking of debate, is never uh, the the ego trap is very strong. Everybody has a very instinctive pull toward the ego, and when you're insulted, responding in that way. And so there's an interview that I did with the BBC that went very viral a few years ago. Right? And in this interview, this person I was on the I was on the line with them for it was supposed to be an interview about my book. The interview was I think 23 minutes, something like that. And the interview was just this person reading nasty old tweets at me mm -hmm. and me saying like I have a. I'm the only person I've ever heard of who has a running list online of all the things I ever think that I've said wrong. And I update it. Like, I actually will go back and I'll say, here's what I think I did wrong. And so I said that. I wouldn't let it go. I do this for like 20 minutes. I'm wiped. And by the end, I'm just like, you know, I'm out. And I just took the microphone off. I left. It goes completely viral. And it went completely viral because I let him get to me and I let the ego monster kind of grab onto me. And so I said a couple of things in the interview that I really regret. Like, I had no idea who the guy was. He's in Britain. I know. So I got, nobody's ever heard of you. Well, I mean, I hadn't heard of him, but it turns out he's actually kind of well, well known in Britain, right? Very stupid. So, you know, it, those sorts of those sorts of things where your ego takes control and gives you the easy answer those are, those are almost always wrong so that, that's a big one and then the countervailing one is that you can't take everybody's criticism too seriously because you have to find a group of people who actually have your best interest at heart who are going to tell you when you're wrong and you can't just have yes men you have to have a lot of people who are willing to, to you know tell you when you can move away from something when you've done something wrong when it's appropriate to apologize but you have to make sure that you trust those people because there are a lot of people out there who are just out to tear you down for sure what do you think, what does Ben Shapiro think is coming over the horizon culturally, politically, oh, man. in the next five years? What should we know that, that you're looking at? Well, I mean, I, I think that the attack on children is just going to continue. I think that the next thing that's going to happen, particularly in blue states, and I have a pretty good track record of predicting what's going to happen in blue states, since everything I've predicted has thus far come true, uh, is that you're going to see an attempt to get rid of accreditation for private schools, get rid of accreditation for home schools. You're going to see blue states that are dedicated to the LGBTQ plus minus divided by sign ampersand tilde agenda, starting to say that if your church or your synagogue does not act in accordance with their quote unquote anti-discrimination law, that they're going to remove nonprofit status. I think that's, that's the next thing that's going to come down the line that's going to be incredibly threatening to kids. It's one of the reasons we moved from California to Florida. I said to my wife, I don't think it's going to be possible to raise my kids religious in California in the next five to 10 years. And nothing I've seen about California makes me reverse that thinking. So I think that's the main danger to people of faith. Um, I think that my, my hope is that what you're going to see on a broader national level is a move away from nationalization of politics and back toward localism and state politics. I think the great sword is helping in this way. I mean, the, the fact that I could take my family and move from California to Florida and I'm much better, living in a place I, I like a lot better, I think that that is, is happening and being mirrored all over the country. That, in turn, is going to lead to a lot of gridlock at the national level. My hope would be that instead of us clubbing each other over the head for control of 51 seats, and then we kind of ram down whatever we please at the top level, we just say, okay, we're going to agree on these five things at the top level, and then you do what you're going to do in California, and we'll do what we're going to do here in Florida, unless you're talking about like a fully fundamental issue like the, the lives of the unborn, which, of course, is, is more equivalent to slavery than anything else. I'm just a few years younger than you. I, I grew up you know, just getting out of college, 2008, 2009, stock market collapse. What would you say to those who are in Gen Z, Gen Alpha coming up, about what's happening right now to the country? What, what should they be prepared for? I mean, I think that they should be prepared that the country, you know, I'm going to be positive here. What they should be prepared for is that they're being told that there's no way they can succeed in the United States of America, and that's a lie. They should, be to, they should be prepared for the level of propaganda that's going to be launched at them, that true happiness is to be found in ditching all of the responsibilities that actually define you as a human being, mm -hmm. and they should be ready to combat that. And if they can combat that, they can lead amazing lives. This is still 
the freest and most prosperous country in the history of the world, in which literal magic happens every single day. I mean, we literally live in a place where you can hit a button on your phone and a product of your choosing arrives at your door within 24 hours at a cheap price. That's insane. Okay, if people had been brought, people from 1910 arrived now, they would think that we lived in some sort of magical universe. And to all extents, I mean, a child born today can expect to live well into their, their ninth decade of life. And these are things that were unthinkable for the vast majority of human history. That is a privilege. And it's incumbent on everybody who is of the younger generation to understand the institutional substructure that lies underneath all of that. And as far as the warning, the warning is the, the warning against seduction. The warning is the same as the biblical warning that Yeshua got fat and kicked. And, you know, that, that you, when you forget the, the pillars that undergird the building of society and you begin to tear those away because you think they're no longer necessary, all you're doing is pulling out the, the, the foundations of, of the entire structure and it's going to collapse in on you. So be a builder rather than a destroyer. One of the things that you're, that you're doing at the Daily Wire is, is recently you announced that you're investing $100 million in children's programming. Um, why are you doing that? And, and what, what is that going to look like? I mean, we're doing it as a response to the fact that they've woke to the children's programming. It's totally crazy. You know, when, when my business partner and I started Daily Wire, years before that, we had discussed how we wanted to get into conservative entertainment. We both looked at each other. We said, there's no market for this. Because the truth is that most conservatives still watch Disney. Most conservatives are still going to you know, consume the same entertainment content as everybody else because, yeah, I mean, there's some leftist content, but it's mostly for the adults, and the kids' content is pretty straightforward, and, you know, there's the occasional show you don't like. Well, now they've decided that it's important to promote transgenderism on Blue's Clues. I mean, they, they've decided that they are going to, this is a direct quote, press forward a not, not at all secret gay agenda in children's programming. It's Latoya Ravenel, an executive producer over at Disney, who said that on a Disney conference call. When, once they decided to do that, it was like, okay, well, somebody's got to produce some sort of alternative here so the parents feel safe putting their kids in front of TV for half an hour while they do the dishes, right? Because th that is usually, look, my kids don't watch hardly any TV. And if they are going to watch TV, the only TV I'll allow them to watch is old programming that I've previously viewed. I don't have time to watch everything that my kids want to watch. I don't. And so my kind of rule of thumb is they don't read anything that's been written after about 1965, and they don't watch anything that's been produced after about 1980. And... You know, that, that's sustainable maybe for me because I know the old, the old shows and the old books, but it's not sustainable for most parents. And so what we want to do is actually create a safe space for people who need a safe space, namely children. We've decided in our society to create safe space for adults and dangerous areas for children, and we want to reverse that polarity. You obviously are deeply involved in, in the political commentary space. Is there a potential for, for you to, to run for office one day? Uh, so my answer to this question is usually that as a prerequisite to running for office, you have to be at least 800 years old. Uh, I am I'm currently 38, which means that I can literally wait for another four decades and still be younger than Joe Biden is today. Right? So I have, I have plenty of time to, to work in the space, build a following, make money, create massive media companies, and then I can consider down the road whether that's something that I wish to do, and I will still be in my 50s. So let's say 80, or 80 years from now, you decide to, to run for office. You're elected president of the United 118, States. 118. Okay, 118. Yeah. <laughs> How, uh, what does President Shapiro do on day one? I fire everyone in the administrative state, all of them. All of them. Everyone goes. Two million people on the red lines. <laughs> I mean, really, you, you, everyone in the administrative state is toast. And I tell Congress, it has to, if you want to pass a piece of legislation, pass a piece of legislation, but we're no longer going to have unelected bureaucrats make... 10,000 pages of rules every single year because that's not how the Constitution was written to be applied. And if you have a problem with that, go to the state level and do it at the state level. And that, that is the, the very first thing that I do, assuming by that point that we've already you know, protected the lives of the unborn because it's been 80 years, and I assume by that point that people have gotten wise to the fact that we can actually see inside the womb and look, see what a baby looks like and all of this. Um, so you know, that, that will be the, you know, it's hard to predict the future as to where we'll be in 80 years, but I have a feeling the size and growth of government is not going to reverse itself so gravely that that will be an irrelevant issue. Who do you look up to? Uh, who do you go to for advice, uh, for mentorship? Who's my dad. Your dad. Yeah. I mean, my, my dad and my mom, both, both my parents. On, on sort of the business practical level, my mom, who's a very practical person, on a sort of family level, life advice level, uh, that usually comes from my dad. The, the, those are the people. And then I have like a close group of friends who I kind of consult with. But yeah, my parents. What's the best piece of advice your dad's given you or your mom? Oh, man. Um, my dad always gets ticked when I say this because the best piece of advice that I've, I've gotten actually was not from either of them. Um, but it, <laughs> um, but uh, and my dad gives me so much. It, it's, it's, honestly, it's, it's hard to say what the best piece of advice my dad has given me because that's like kind of saying what's your favorite particle of air to breathe. Like, it, mm -hmm. it, like I live in the, in the structure created by my parents and in the value system they created. So it's, it's so hard. It's like what's your favorite picture with your parents? Like there's so many of them, right? Um, 
you know, the one, in business, actually, this one, here's a business one for my dad. So this one for my dad is that there's a time to, there's a time to plant seeds and there's a time to reap and you shouldn't confuse the two. Because very often you'll, you'll think, okay, well, why am I not reaping? Why am I not reaping? What's happening right now? And the answer is you didn't plant the seed. Or you're not planting seeds, you're, you, or you've planted the seeds, and now you're waiting for them to grow, but you're impatient. You're like, why isn't it coming to fruition? Well, you need to plant some more seeds. And so that, that's, a, that's a good piece of business advice from my dad. And the, the other advice you know, that, that my dad really took to heart, because he was the one at home raising us most of the time, uh, is that, you know, look, all the time in the world that you do not with your kids is time that you're probably going to want back. And so I'm, I'm very lucky. I've been able to structure my life in such a way that my kids don't know I have a job. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with them in the morning until they leave for school. I work hard until they get home. They get home. I pick them up from school. I'm with them literally from the time they get to come home from school until the time they go to bed. And then after they go to bed, I do some work and hang out with my wife. So my, my kids don't know I have a job, which is a, like, thank God. I, 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 you know, I'm very privileged. Yeah. I, get to, I get to structure my day the way that I want to structure my day. Why should, why should Americans be helpful right now? I mean, they should be hopeful because the backlash to the insane craziness of the left has begun. The left pushed too hard, and now the reaction has begun. And it's going to come in some pretty unexpected ways for the left. I mean, they assumed, for example, that Hispanic voters were going to continue to vote Democrat. That is not happening. They assumed that they were going to be able to push so far culturally that a vast majority of Americans were suddenly going to embrace the idea that little boys could be turned into little girls, and that's not happening. They, they were of the opinion that they could indoctrinate the next generation of children without pushback. That's not going to happen. The parents' movement is one of the most encouraging things that I've seen in my political lifetime. Final question. This is probably, it's perhaps the most important thing that I've asked you while you've been here. Rachel Maddow, Michael Knowles. Same person? Man, that's real hard on Rachel Maddow. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Ben, appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.